unprecedented and uh, you know different to what we've ever experienced. We've had to make changes in our lives of you know how we live and you know where we go, what we do, what we don't do, who we see, who we don't see, whether we go to school or whether we don't go to school. I've even had to make a change in my life because we're doing so many things virtually on the computer. I've invested in a microphone and, and a special microphone, which is actually uh, more professional than what I had, which is just my little webcam. And uh, I, uh, I thought, well, I'm gonna, I'll be doing some preaching, so I'd better try and uh, get a microphone which helps me, helps my, my sermons rather than just relying on my webcam. So we all have to make changes uh, at this time. And, uh, you know, we're all kind of hoping things are going to be going back to normal slowly. The government sort of uh, brought in a few uh, changes to the lockdown last week, I think, to many of our, um, many of our reliefs. And uh, uh, it's an interest, it's a very interesting time. But because of, I think, we, we realise that we're so, um, it's such a different time, and we're so in uh, unprecedented waters, some interesting things have been happening in, in, in the UK, and particularly in the world of faith. So if I show you some statistics here, since the start of the coronavirus pandemic, these are statistics that Alex Clegg showed me this week, three more million people have started to pray. There's been a 55% increase in Bible sales and online church attendance, so church attendance in general, obviously now it's generally online, it's up from a norm, the norm of about 6%, up, up four times as much to 24%. Now that's very interesting. I wasn't expecting that um, during coronavirus, but because of the, the pandemic, people seem to be appreciating God more. By the way, if you want the, uh, the article that I I, uh, I, got, I, I got from Alex, which has all these statistics in it and has some kind of information about all this. Let me know. I'll happily, uh, I'll happily send it to you. But the reality is people in the UK are appreciating God. And, you know, it's a real chance for us as Christians to be able to share our faith. What an opportunity it is for us to, uh, people are keen to hear about God. People want to know uh, about what it about Jesus. People want to know about hope, and we as Christians have a wonderful opportunity uh, to share that. And I thought today it would be lovely if um, all of us, uh, some of us in the, in the group, got to share a bit about a quality of God that we really appreciate. I was quickly going to share a story from the Bible that I find really helps me, uh, you know, appreciate God and uh, a quality in there that, uh, that I really, I really, really value. So I'm going to, we're going to read a bit today from Daniel chapter six. And uh, Daniel's an interesting character. He's actually very topical. This is one of my favorite Bible stories, um, my favorite Bible stories, but it's also a very topical one because Daniel himself found, um, he found himself in a situation uh, in, in a, in a, in a, in a eerily similar situation to us in lockdown. Now, Daniel is a Jew. He was a Jew. He was around in the, you know, probably around 700, 600 uh, B BC. And uh, <clears throat> he, was, he, was, he was a Jew and he was from Jerusalem. And uh, he'd, his, his country of uh, Israel had been uh, invaded by the, the, the Babylonians. And the Babylonians had, uh, you know, laid siege, siege to Jerusalem and taken a number of the, the Jews off to Babylon. Daniel was one of these Jews. So that meant Daniel was in exile. Now, when you're in exile, you don't have the same freedom that you normally have, a bit like us in lockdown. Daniel would have seen many of his people he knew die. We see people, you know, die because of coronavirus. Daniel wouldn't have had the same freedom to go and do whatever he wanted. He wouldn't have been able to see people who he would have been able to see when he was in a free country. So there are actually some interesting similarities between our situation and Daniel's situation. Now, Daniel works in the king's palace. So Daniel uh, works in, in the palace of King Darius. He's, uh, Daniel's done quite well, actually, by this stage. We're going to pick up kind of uh, at, in chapter six of, of, uh, of the book of Daniel. And before this, Daniel has really shown himself to be a man of integrity and a man of faith. And because of this, he's, he's been, he's been uh, promoted 
in his in his work in the palace and he's actually seen as a very uh, credible person but so often when you have success comes well, so often when we have success that also brings jealousy uh, of, of of people who work alongside us and daniel uh, is experiencing that jealousy here let's read in Jan daniel chapter 6 and we're going to pick up in verse 6 so these chief ministers and satraps these are daniel's colleagues went as a group to the king and said <clears throat> may king darius live forever the royal ministers, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repe repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except to you, your majesty, will be thrown to the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sunset to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict, or, 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 edict, or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, who you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the ring of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. The king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of, the, of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. May my God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. So for Daniel, life's already challenging. He's been captured by the, Babylon, by the Babylonians. The Babylonians have been uh, taken over by the Persians. Uh, Darius is king of the Persians. And life is tough for Daniel in lockdown in 600 BC. And as if it couldn't get any worse, Daniel gets ganged up on by his co-workers in, in, uh, in the palace. And we see in, in verse 7 that the royal administrators, the prefects, the satraps, the advisors and the governors, they all gang up on him and try and trick, trick, trick King Darius into sending Daniel in, 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 into, a, into the lion's den and to get rid of him forever. And they come up with this very evil plan to say that basically oh, people should only be allowed to pray to King Darius. And because, Dave, uh, because Daniel is a man of conviction and a man of faith, he says, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to stick to my convictions. Now, we're not totally sure why Daniel decides to stick to his conviction, but it's certainly something to do with his relationship with God. He clearly values his relationship with God very highly. And we see in verse 11, uh, verse 10, that Daniel, despite the fact he's received uh, this decree, he still is praying three times a day with the window open. How brave is that? And despite that, despite his bravery, almost because of his bravery, he pays the price. In verse 16, the king hears about this, and despite not being 
uh, not realizing that the, the, when he brought in this new rule about praying only to him, which I'm sure he thought was a brilliant rule, he, he realizes that this is actually going to mean the death of one of his best servants. So he sadly, in verse 16, has to throw Daniel into the lion's den. And we all think that's the end of Daniel. But as, but as is the case with God, it's never really the end with God. The thing I love about God is that he never lets us down. And God did not let Daniel down. In verse 22, we read about how God shuts the mouths of the lions. You know, I've never met a lion happily. I've been to South Africa, to, to Rudy's home country, to, to Heinrich Stag do last year. And uh, I, I met giraffes and uh, zebras, but not a lion. I can imagine if I met a lion, I might feel a bit afraid. And if I was in a lion's den, I wouldn't expect to come out alive. But with God, there's always hope. God never lets us down, no matter how bad the situation might seem. And that's what happened to Daniel. It says in verse 22, Daniel says, the lions have not hurt me because I was found innocent in God's sight. Daniel's faith, not because he was perfect, no, 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 no human is perfect, but because he was innocent, because he trusted God, Daniel was able to be rescued from the lions. You know, what I appreciate most, one, one of the things most about God is the fact that he will never let me down. I know in my life, there have been many times where I felt like I'm in big trouble here. But God has always come through for me. I felt this many times when I was uh, at university. As many of you know, I'm a, I'm a dentist. And uh, I remember many times having an exam or a, uh, a clinical uh, practical assessment that I thought I'm in trouble for, uh, you know, uh, the, the day before thinking I'm in real trouble for this exam. One, um, one of the subjects that I was, I was very, uh, had a real, uh, I suppose you could say, a passion for in, uh, in dental school was uh, the, the, the topic of, uh, well, it's a very, very topical topic because uh, it was called infection control. And that's all to do with personal protective equipment and PPE and washing your hands and those sorts of things. At, uh, at, um, and, and that's very topical because we're all the, the, the BBC on the, on the BBC News. You'll, you'll read about shortages of PPE and how important infection control is with preventing spread of the coronavirus. And um, that was a topic that for, for, I won't go into all the reasons why, but that was a topic that I had a particular, uh, I wouldn't even, even say passion for, I would say more obsession for at university. And there were many times when I, I was trying to learn how to do a filling that I couldn't get past infection control. And it came to the day of, uh, so, you know, I did a, a year of trying to learn how to do a filling, remove decay from a tooth and put a, a metal filling in the tooth or a white filling in the tooth. And uh, to prove that you'd learned something over the year, it came to the day of my license to cut exam, license to cut teeth. If I pass this exam, I would be allowed to no longer just work on teeth that had been uh, taken out from people's mouths already. And I'd actually be able to work on live people at university. And it came to the day of the exam. And I thought to myself, I'm not even going to be able to get past all this infection control stuff with, I was so focused on just washing my hands and was my gloves on the right way round and all those sorts of things that I thought, how am I going to be able to drill this tooth properly, let alone put, put a filling in over the top? And I thought, I need God to rescue me. And lo and behold, who would be, who would be uh, marking my exam? It would be the head of infection control at the university. That was all the confidence I needed. I thought to myself, wow, he'll really respect me. The fact that I so value the need to wash my hands and, uh, and, and, and wear all the correct protective equipment. And, you know, because I really had been feeling like if I get a normal clinical teacher, I'm doomed. There's no way I'm going to pass because they'll, they'll look at my dentistry. But, uh, but, uh, this, but, then I, but, then, but then since I was marked by the, the head of infection control, I thought, he'll look at my infection control. I might actually pass. And hey, presto, I passed first time. I couldn't really believe it. By the way, I have learned to do fillings since, since finishing dental school. And I am now a dentist. And I can actually do fillings. I'm not quite as obsessed with infection control as I was at university. But I'll always remember that time of, uh, you know, being obsessed with infection control and thinking, I'm not going to be able to pass this exam. But then, you know, having, having that, God putting that examiner 
uh, that infection control master, someone who uh, I would have looked up to so much at, uh, at university, but putting him as my examiner and really just, you know, always for me being confident that, but that, that helped me to be confident that, you know, God's looking out for me and I was able to pass the exam. I remember another exam when uh, I really felt like oh, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do whatever comes up in this exam. And there was only one question that came up in the whole exam. And guess what? It was on infection control. And I couldn't really believe it. I looked at it. I thought, this is ridiculous. And I remember doing the exam thinking that was really the only thing that I'd really revised properly because I was really, I was really good at it and I could just do it. And I know I probably sound like I was obsessed and there's no point even saying I sound it. I would sound obsessed. I was obsessed, but you know, God looked out for me. I remember the, 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 the teacher talking to me about my exam script after he'd marked it. And he almost looked, um, he almost looked a bit stunned. He was like, this is so good. I can't really believe how good this is. I'm going to give this out to the rest of the class because it's such a good exam paper. It was God. It wasn't me. It was God who looked after me. God didn't let me down. Despite feeling like, oh, I'll fail this practical exam or I'll fail this essay, God came through. And despite my foibles and my weaknesses and my obsessions, which were, you know, uh, certainly dysfunctional, God came through and he didn't let me down. Something I appreciate about So God is that he doesn't let us down. Uh, I wanted to give all of us a, a, a brief chance to share about some of the qualities of, of God we really appreciate. Um, so if you can, if you want to share, you don't have to share. If you can, if you'd like to share a quality that, um, that, God, that you most appreciate about God, it can have a story. It doesn't have to have a story. It can be related to coronavirus. It, it doesn't have to be. Um, it can be to do with Daniel and the lion's den, but it doesn't have to be. Please write down in the in the chat box if you would like to share, and uh, Rudy will unmute you, and you'll get a chance to share. Thank you. So there's the chat box. More chat, right? Okay. So Alex Clark wants to share. Alex Clark, can we please unmute Alex Clark? Right, Clark gang. Take eating clocks. You're unmuted. Um. One time um, I was, we were at church um, and I was a bit rude to somebody and they, um, I wasn't very nice to them and then um, we, she actually turned out to be um, my friend after mm. that and she um, was really kind and I realised that I was rude to her and then we were friends. And the person is um, Joyce. I don't know if she's on. Joyce. 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 Yeah. She was really kind to me, and I was very rude to her, and that taught me that I should be more kind to people. Thank you, Alex. That's certainly a time where God didn't let you down. He, uh, it can be very hard to say sorry. Sorry sometimes can be the hardest word to say, but he certainly didn't let you down when you said sorry. Thank you, Alex. Who else would like to share? We've got Malcolm saying he appreciates God's wisdom and Joy saying she appreciates how God never gives up on us. He's very patient. That's a great point. Would anybody else like to share a quality about God that they really, really like, that they really appreciate at this time? Oh, Alice is going to go. I, I was just thinking that I appreciate the way that um, God can never misunderstand us. And he, um, you know, he understands each of us so well in our interactions. Sometimes when we have difficult interactions with people we love or people at work or friends or whatever, that um, he understands them as well as me. So he can understand the whole situation fully. He doesn't see things just through my perspective. 
So he's, yeah, he can never misunderstand me or anyone else. I've had a few people saying he's forgiving. Jessica says he's forgiving. Yannette says he's forgiving. And Manny says, I appreciate God's forgiveness. Thank you. Sarah says God is dependable. Yes, what a great quality. He's dependable and faithful. When he says he'll do something, he does. Lovely. Anybody else? Marlon says God is generous, gives us his best, including his word. Yes, that's a great point. Pip says God will provide. Very true. God, God, God does provide. Ah, God is proactive. Oh, that's an interesting one. Thank you. Thank you, Mihai. That's a good one. Oh, yes, patient. Thank you. The last quiz is. Oh, Richard Bailey. Oh, wow. I remember Richard says, I remember at university, there was another, another student who didn't like me sharing my faith. He said to me, I can see what you're doing and, I try, and, and uh, I'm, I'm going to oppose you. Oh, gosh. I prayed for God's help. And then someone told me within a few days he left. He suddenly had moved back to Scotland. God is faithful and see, we'll see our hearts to share about him and we'll remove obstacles. Yeah, great point. Great point. We'll remove obstacles. He's, he's, he's powerful. The Monroes. God is faithful and answers prayer. Johnson, he's trustworthy and holy. Iggy, God is able. Yes, God is able. Certainly not unable. God has been with me and my son throughout our whole life and uh, who, who leads me on the path to raising, raising my son on my own with God in my life. That's from Gene A. Thank you. Alexa, his plans are just. Thank you. Just, yes, God is a just God. I was thinking about that this week. Very true, very true. Ah, his healer. God, God is a healer. Yes, that, that's right, Mohan. From Manny, God's faithfulness and his zeal. Yes, these are great qualities. You know, we can talk about these uh, until the cows come home. He always has a plan. Sam says God always has a plan. That's a great point. And I think this the reason why, we'll, we'll, we'll stop that for the moment. Thank you for everybody who, who's uh, contributed the last one from Ruth. He, he creates situations to teach us and strengthen our faith. Very, very true. Very true. You know, we've got a chance. We're very blessed as Christians to be able to appreciate God in our lives. God wants to be in our lives. If you are, if you are a Christian, I encourage you, talk about this over lunch. Talk about what you appreciate about God. And if you're not a Christian, still talk about it. And maybe ask someone who's invited you today or someone you know on this call to explain to you more about all these qualities that we can appreciate about God, because there are so very many. At the end of the day, we only, in the day in life, we really have, uh, there's only one thing in life that will help us uh, sleep well at night. There's always obstacles, always confusion, always things that are uh, we face, which are a great, um, bring, bring uncertainty into our lives. There's always things that bring, um, there's always things we can't control, but there's only one thing that brings true security. In John chapter three, verse 16, God says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That certainty is God and the fact that he loves us and that he wants us to be saved. And that was that love that God had, that God has for us, and God had for us 2,000 years ago, was played out on a cross in Israel. God came down, Jesus came down, God's son, as a human. He, um, he died on a cross. He was put to death, even though he was innocent and he'd never sinned. And he died so that we might have our sins forgiven, so that we might have our mistakes wiped out the things, the mistakes that are both big and small, the, the mistakes that deserve us to not be able to have a relationship with God. Jesus came and wiped those away. He gave us a chance for eternal life. He gave us a chance to be with God forever. This is, this, this is a very special and uh, timely photo. I don't, you, you, some, of, some of us in, 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 on this call may know these three people. Uh, the lady on the left is a lady called Abiola. She's a Christian in the Bournemouth church and uh, she has two sons and uh, there they are, Nick and Alex. Alex became a Christian 
um, in the, he, he goes to university in Boston. He be, became a Christian uh, in the Boston church uh, a year ago. And, and um, just this week, Nick, his brother, who's part of the amazing team ministry, I'm looking at Ruan and Nathan, come, come on the teens, come on Sam. Um, Nick became a Christian this week. He decided to trust Jesus with his life, to trust Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, to give his life to Jesus and live his life God's way. Nick, Nick was able to experience that John 3, 16. Nick was able to experience that chance of eternal life. Nick had his sins washed away earlier this week. On, uh, on Thursday, we, we were able, some of us were able to watch over Zoom as Nick had his sins washed away and he entered into an eternal life and an eternal relationship with God. That's what Jesus brings. Jesus brings uh, freedom. He brings us eternal life. And it's because of his sacrifice that we can be free from fear. Thank you very much. And uh, before we take communion, Anna is going to pray. Mm -hmm.